the Curbsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like moral hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we aren't responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Welcome back to the Curbsiders Teach Season 3, our mini-series on medical education. I'm Dr. Ira Krasinovska, stepping into the role of my fearless leader and podcast co-host, Dr. Molly Hoiblein, who we are missing today, but we are joined by the amazing Curbsiders co-hosts, Cleo and Chris. On tonight's special cross... Oh, what's that? I'm just saying sup. <laughs> oh, sup! Love it. <laughs> like, what's up? Um, on tonight's special crossover episode with our friends at the Crip Setters, we'll discuss learners as teachers with Dr. C- Travis Crook. But before we get started with that, Chris, will you remind the audience what we do on the show? Yes. So today we are actually the combo hybrid of the pediatric and internal medicine podcast for all things medical education. We use expert interviews to bring you leading pearls and practice changing knowledge to inspire next generation of medical educators and answer lingering questions about core topics in pediatric and adult medicine. Um, If you are listening to this episode through our Cripsider feed, if you enjoy all this talk about teaching and education, just know that The Curbsiders Teach is a full series that are starting their season three, as Ira said. And if you love Teach, you got to check out them and subscribe. Yes, and tonight we have a great conversation with our guest, Dr. Travis Crook. Dr. Crook is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics in the Division of Hospital Medicine at Vanderbilt University. He is the Director of the Pediatrics Clerkship and the Director of the Clerkship Year, as well as the Director of Master Clinical Teacher Program at Vandy. He has a passion for evidence-based medicine and, more importantly, understanding why we do the things we do to care for our patients. We are very excited and thrilled to have him on this episode today. Totally agree, Cleo. I feel like he's the director of directors. Um, (laughs) And if y'all enjoy this episode and all of our Curbsiders family episode, please consider supporting us via our Patreon. You can check out details on the website and a reminder that most episodes are available for free CME credit through VCU Health CE for all healthcare professionals at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. All you have to do is create an account. So before we get into the episode, I want to share an AI-generated haiku. The best teachers learn from the students they teach and guide a lifelong journey. Ooh. Oh my gosh. I feel like that's the basic summary of this entire episode. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. That really hits. <laughs> AI creates the best poems. <laughs> Love it. Hello, Dr. Travis Crook. Thanks for coming on the show with us. Is it okay if we call you Travis for the recording? Of course. I would have it no other way. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Travis. Um, let's start with some rapid fire questions, if that's okay, and we'll get to know you a little bit better. Sure. Can you, can you start with a one liner and give us a little description about yourself? A one liner, my assessment of myself. Forty um, year old male, uh, married to the most amazing woman in the world, uh, father of three, diehard Clemson fan, pediatric mm-hmm. hospitalist by trade, and that's what pays the bills. But educator at heart. Oh my gosh. I didn't know you were a Clemson fan, Travis. I'm not sure where, uh, I'm a UVA fan, so I'm not sure where we can be on this podcast together. Oh, that's okay. No. We're going to work through hey it. Now, hey now. So <laughs> you know, it's all about bridging differences, right? <laughs> I know. I know. Um, well, I know you may have answered a similar question in the past, but is there um, a kind of book, movie, show, album, something recently from the entertainment industry that you have enjoyed? Yeah, so last time I went kind of like highbrow and I recommended The Obstacle is the Way. Uh, I think it's a fantastic book. I'm going to go a little bit different this time, shake it up. Uh, K-pop. Uh, K-pop's amazing. Uh, so if you haven't gotten into it, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and just figuring out, uh, you know, what moves you and what kind of upbeat music you listen to. Mamamoo was just here in Nashville, Music City. Uh, and I, my wife went to see them last night. and It was an absolute fantastic blast. So that's, that's going to be my recommendation for you all this time around. Okay, well... The next question I would love to know, Travis, um, is I think along going along with this episode, learning a little bit about what some meaningful feedback or advice has been given to you that has really uh, made an impact on your training. Yeah, I I think 
and think about this question, I, I think one of the things I go back to and I found myself giving out a couple of times this past month or so um, was that sometimes good is good enough, right? And there's a lot of different ways of, of phrasing that. You know, best is the enemy of good, better is the enemy of good. Voltaire has talked about this. You know, it goes back a long ways. But finding, you know, for those of us who strive to be excellent in everything, you pour your heart and soul to everything you do you can't do it all very well. And at some points you have to understand what is just good enough. And so finding out both the things that are less important and not good enough, but also what like sits right in your soul and in your heart to being like, I'm okay with that being okay. And figuring out what those things are and trying to hit those targets so that you can really pour yourself into those more meaningful tasks that are more meaningful for those around you, but also more meaningful for yourself. And so I think the sooner you can accept the fact that sometimes okay is okay, uh, the better off you'll be. That's awesome. great advice. Yeah. yeah. Sucks, do we have any? All. Do we have any picks, Cleo, Chris, that we need to highlight? Oh, I got one. I got one. Uh, all right. I might have. I, you know, I said this already on one of our Cripside episodes, but who knows? Like when this episode is going to come in relation? But I always, I want to hawk it. So I recently got this book called "These Vital Signs" from Dr. Syed Tabatabai. He is the real Dr. T on Twitter. He is a fantastic narrative uh, humanist. Uh, storyteller, it's just wonderful. His book is amazing. I want. I think everyone should should read this book. It's fantastic. You can get it on all whatever your favorite bookseller is. But I really, really encourage people to check this out. Thank you for that. I have one too. I was in New York a few weeks ago, and I saw Parade on Broadway, which is um, a revival musical that I didn't really know much about before, but it is excellent. It stars Ben Platt and Kayla Diamond, and it's nominated for a whole bunch of Tonys right now. So, oh, Ben Platt, and it's got to be amazing then, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Well, just to continue the trend of media and maybe some um, singing and music, my pick of the week is actually a book that's turned into a mini series. I don't know if y'all have heard about Daisy Jones and the Six, but it's basically the chronicling of a what I understand is a fictional rock band in the 70s and kind of going through um, – almost like documentary style interviews with members of the band and talking about kind of uh, what happened to this fictional band and how they kind of rose and, and then fell um, together and uh, kind of the melding of, we'll say, um, stars and personalities. And it's been turned into a mini series on, I think, Amazon Prime, I think, I'm not 100% sure, but um, is really fascinating just kind of the way that it's told. It's the the um, novels by Taylor Jenkins Reid, and it's basically kind of told from the perspective of interviews, like kind of like a documentary. So Daisy says this, or Billy says this, and um, it's really gripping, and you kind of feel like you're in the 1970s and all the... <laughs> the rock and roll, the music, the sex, the drugs, everything that's happening and just kind of the um, experiences of these um, band members. So if you're looking for like a book to turn into a movie series, um, <laughs> I would uh, to kind of really continue the escapist fiction, uh, then I would recommend Daisy Jones and the Six. It's giving me this is Spinal Tap vibes. Yeah, kind of, kind of. <laughs> Except I think Spinal Tap is like even funnier. This one is like <laughs> vaguely kind of trying to recollect what happened in the 70s in somewhat of a real way but with a fictional band so you're saying cool. this one doesn't go to 11 is that is that <laughs> <sighs> yeah no <laughs> i see what you did there thanks somebody um, has to <laughs> well just to get us going cleo do you want to start us off with a case i have a case from Cashlack Children's, and this is Tim. He's a second-year pediatrics resident who is really excited about a career as a clinical uh, clinician educator after he graduates. And his program, based in rural Cashlack, Cashlack Children's, is smaller. And while he's been thrilled with the clinical training he's receiving, he wishes there were more formal opportunities to hone his skills as an educator since he sees this as a very valuable part of his future career. So, Travis, thinking about this intro case, um, you were one of the co-founders of a formal residence as teachers program, um, the Academy of Resident Educators that you started in 2013 at Baylor. We would love to hear a little bit about this program and what you got, got you excited about this topic. Uh, I First of all, I'm just impressed with your research. I don't know how you found that, uh, that I was one of the co-founders of that thing. Um, 
but yeah, it was really, really cool. So, uh, second year resident and we were sitting around myself and, uh, Prathik Kulkarni, who is still uh, a faculty member there at Baylor. Uh, by the way, his Twitter is a fantastic handle. If uh, you want to follow that one, it's just Prathik Kulkarni. Um, lots of good education stuff out there. Um, but the two of us were co-residents and we were sitting around and we actually were just very envious of some of the opportunities that some of our colleagues had when talking about global health or they're talking about policy and, while recognizing the things were important, those weren't our passions. And we looked at ourselves and said, education's our passion. Where's our special guidance? Where's our training? And it made us take a huge step back and think about the more completeness of what residency training should be. And while we were getting, just like Tim in this case, while we we're getting excellent clinical education, the thinking about if this is what I want to make my career from, when I hit being a faculty member, am I just supposed to do it and like not have no guidance, no toolbox, no just learn on the job? And so thinking, where are the gaps in our educational training? And so it kind of came out of the two of us sitting around and being a little mad at the world that we didn't have this opportunity. And so we went to um, a couple of our trusted uh, educational supervisors and we said, we'd like to have more training. What could this look like? And in true educator fashion, uh, they give us the yes and. It was not a, tell us more, or, well, what can we do? It was like, okay, how do we make this a formal track that all residents can do? If you were going to, like, the world was your oyster, what would you do? How would this look? What do you think is important? What are you not getting? Um, and, and so I think some important lessons learned from that, number one is that yes and approach is just, it's hugely validating. And being put in that position to be able to actually make the change we wanted to make as opposed to having to fight and justify our position. And we were all ready to get in there and Perry Mason our case out for them. And it was, it was made exceptionally easy for us. And then I think the wisdom on their end to help us think through the parameters and help us provide that structural backbone of what was necessary, what was needed in order to make this successful, as opposed to just saying, design this thing and how, because I, I think that's the other direction. If you're given too much free reign and too much you know, space to operate, it can be very overwhelming. And so putting some guardrails and some confines on it and building that formal structure and being very intentional with it. Um, I mean, that's how this whole thing came about. I, I cannot say enough about um, one, my partner in crime for and helping us build that thing. But number two, the educators at uh, Baylor who just said yes. Feels like they really were into the improv of like, yes, and we're going to make it an academy, you know? Yeah. And, and I wonder, Travis, like to that end, um, can you share more about the content of the actual Academy of Resident Educators or maybe even similar programs? Like, how did you decide, yes, I want education training as a, as a learner and I'm going to make it into an academy? Because that feels, you know, bold to say the yeah. least. You know, I think it was actually a really important step, right? Because I think that sometimes education can get shoehorned into this thing you do on the side, as opposed to having that part of your professional identity and taking it a very serious nature. And so I think that formation of making it an academy and being intentional, you have to apply to get in, you have to demonstrate willingness, you have to meet requirements. Um, that accountability, uh, it also reinforces that this is part of your professional development. This is important. And so putting that emphasis on it also in terms of uh, uh, validates what you're trying to accomplish. Accomplish there. Uh, in terms of the content, I, you know, the, I think that's one of the other things that's really important to talk about is I, I think when we talk about learners as teachers, so many programs focus on how do you become a better teacher? And yes, that's really important, right? Bedside education, teaching in the classroom, chalk docs, those things are important. But that's not the totality of your professional identity as an educator. There's administrative responsibilities that go along with that. There is feedback that goes along with that. There are um, a lot of other behind the scenes things that an educator does, understanding educational theory, proving educational excellence, whether you're talking about like educational value units, the equivalent of RVUs to justify your worth, or talking about what an educator portfolio looks like um, in terms of not just that I teach, but I was good at it. Uh, those things are important. And so giving a well-rounded framework to all those things. So I, I think the content's probably changed and evolved a lot of these. In fact, I hope it has um, evolved over the years. All good curriculums are about change. If you're not changing, you're not doing something correct. Um, and so I, I think that it has to necessarily evolve and change over the years. But I think one of the core tenets of anybody who's thinking about putting something like this together is to not just get stuck on that teaching and think about what does it mean to be an educator? And there's a difference between being a good educator and being a good teacher. And I, I think that pushing ourselves to consider those things that make you an educator and all the skills that go along with that, um, leadership skills, working with interpersonal teams, teaching at different levels, 
edge care portfolio justifying worth, all that kind of stuff is really important when you are fleshing out what that content's going to look like. Um, deeper dive into actual content and the, the media stuff, we talked about some of those things, but I think teaching at the bedside, clinical skills, teaching physical exam skills, how to teach with physical exam versus knowledge, right? working through the di- different Bloom's taxonomies, Simpsons, understanding those type of technical details are going to be very important. So that educational theory and providing that framework so that when you are telling them how to do it correctly, they understand why it's important to do it that way. Um, I think if you hit on those, those few things, I think that whatever you set up in terms of that content is probably giving me the right ballpark. Mm. I guess I wonder, you know, the follow-up question, Travis is like, I, you know, at my institution, we have an Academy of medical educators, right? And that is for faculty. And I find that the fact that you created one for residents just really um, incredible. And I feel like almost visionary. And so I just wonder how, the understanding of, you know, the um, the theory, the kind of Bloom's taxonomy, the um, role of an educator's portfolio, how does that change when you're thinking about it from the lens of a resident or of a learner? Because I feel like we have a lot of amazing role models in terms of programs and institutions that have academies of medical educators for faculty, but I just feel like this really nice lens of the learner for this um, is really important to highlight. Yeah, I, I think I think it's in terms of professional development and looking along those pathways, right? And so I wouldn't even stop at residence. I think you have to go all the way back to medical students. I think that when you're on this professional pathway, it's a continuum. And you think about it, all the other things that we talk about, we talk about clinical competency are on a continuum, right? We have ACGME milestones for residents. We have competency-based milestones for the students who are supposed to be on this continuum as they're marching through professional development. Why would this be any different? If this is part of our job and part of what we're supposed to be doing, then I think it's on that continuum. Now, necessarily, some of the ins and outs and the nitty gritty details are going to change based on your level and what's going to be applicable and relevant to you. In the same way that if we're talking about a disease state or you know a pathophysiology, what I teach to a medical student is going to be different than what I teach to a resident. It's going to be different than what I teach to junior faculty. Um, and so there's developmental progress that goes along the way. So I think about sequencing in our curriculum terms, thinking about what's going to be right for the content context alignment. Um, those things are important to consider. But I think about that you have to you have to consider this as a professional continuum as a whole. And I, I, I think the younger we start in our careers and identifying this and start providing those toolboxes and that equipment for them, the better they're going to do in Excel. They can't reach the next stage until they reach the first one. And so I I think the students who are interested and they are showing promise in this, why wouldn't we reach out and design this for them? And Travis, have, have you thought about how programs like this may, you mentioned it being a continuum and other professions or uh, like undergraduate medical education may benefit from something like this. How can a program like this be integrated in either other types of healthcare professions or undergraduate medical education? I mean, I think intentionality, right? I, I think understanding your audience and intentionality of where you want to end up. Um, it, tenets of education design start with the end of mind, right? So knowing where you want to end up and where you want to go at each stage of the way and then backwards designing where you want to get there. Um, I, I think that when you talk about the medical students, um, if, you, if you're talking undergraduate medical education, take your senior students who are a little bit further along in the professional development and may have some differentiation and knowing where they want to go and knowing that you can provide the comfort of teaching opportunities to more junior medical students. So you lift some of that burden of having to teach uphill or even teaching to peers um, to empower them, but also starting them on that journey of curiosity when we talk about educational theory, right? The goal here is not to understand educational theory in and out. It's to get them used to that concept, get them excited about it, get them to learn a little bit more, understanding that there's a whole world of literature out there that they may not have been exposed to, understanding and having them reflect back and be like, oh, that exceptional teacher I had during first year was exceptional because of this, not just because there were some gifted human being standing up there. They probably were gifted, but there was probably a lot of intentionality and work that went into that. And just having those light bulb moments and having them start making those connections will influence how they view education and how they start taking it on. And when you start talking about residency and now it's truly part of their professional identity, now we can really start delving in and developing those skills. Now we're beyond making those connections and saying, great, you see the value of it. How do I build that in you? And start building that up and provide that toolbox. And so in the residency realm, in the uh, GME realm, I start thinking about, If they're going to be a first-year faculty or a second-year faculty right away, and I think they're talented, and I think they're ready to educate, and they're going to have a formal role, 
How do I make sure they step into that role ready to go as opposed to having to learn on the job? There's always going to be things that you have to learn when you first get there. But the more I can equip them with things that you have to know, understand, and be successful, then the more I think we've done our job. And so that I think that's where I would approach those things in, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish at each stage of the, of the way. Travis, you were, you're, you're sort of in, in the middle of that, um, that discussion. You were saying something about you know trying to convey excitement as sort of being mm-hmm. the basis of where it comes. Can you explain a little bit on how you personally uh, approach excitement? Is it just you're naturally ex- – I mean, obviously, you're very excited about this. Um, but not everyone may be naturally excited. Is, do, do we – and is it mostly coming as a role modeling sort of excitement, that sort of thing? And for – you know, we, we may have people who are excited who are excited about education, but they don't have the same sort of uh, personality. How, how would you have some of those uh, those teachers approach that? I like that nice, easy, straightforward question with a very simple answer. Mm-hmm. Um, no, it's really complex, right? It's really complicated. Uh, yeah, first of all, yes, I'm very excited. I'm an excited person by nature, but I love teaching. And one of my favorite things to teach about is teaching about teaching. And then I got to this podcast, so now I'm teaching about teaching about teaching, which is just phenomenal, honestly. (laughs) Um, But to get to your question, right, so that that excitement phase, that curiosity, um, and and how do we stoke that? At at its soul, that's what education is. Education is not providing knowledge. Education is kindling that fire. And so I think that if we've done that and we get those those, uh, learners excited about what they're doing, then that's where you want to go. To talk a little bit more about some of the nuances that you asked in there. First of all, anybody who gives you the feedback that your personality or personality traits aren't a match for X, Y, or Z, you can take that feedback and throw it in the trash. You are fine the way you are. You are a wonderful person the way you are. And we harness our gifts, which are different in each one of us and our talents that are different in each one of us and use them to the best of our abilities to provide back. So I think that if you are not a super dynamic person or you're not super excitable or that sort of thing, that's okay. That's fine. Um, you find what does get your point across and how are you going to best reach your learners. And if you are still motivated, fulfilled by teaching, then you're in the right pathway. Um, I think that education is one of those things where you are always going to pour more into that than what you get out of that from my financial or time standpoint. It's just the fact of the matter. However, the vast majority of educators will tell you that they pour their heart and soul into it and get more back and they end up feeling more fulfilled. And so part of when we talked about this origin of like the Academy of Educators and when this kind of hit me of like, I wanted to do this thing. I was a second year pediatrics resident and I saw the pediatric students were going up for the shelf exam and they didn't feel on the clerkship and they didn't feel super prepared. And so here I was post call having worked 30 hours and I went home and I slept for like two or three and then I came back to the hospital, um, which my program director didn't know about and doesn't need to know about. And I came back to the hospital and I held a three hour review session before the shelf. And so here I'm on three hours sleep in the last 48 hours teaching. And as I'm driving to the hospital, I'm like, man, I am dumb. Like, why did I do this? And I ended up leaving there thinking this is what I want to do the rest of my life. And so I think that's the note we're trying to hit is when we find those educators who say, I, this fills up my bucket. I leave here with more energy than I put in, then you're in the right pathway. And that's not for everyone. And that's okay. It's okay not to be energized and motivated by education. Everyone has their own niche. Everyone's going to find their own way and saying like, I like education, but it's not for me. It's fine. That's how I feel about QI, right? Like QI is fine. It's necessary process improvement. It doesn't get me out of bed in the morning and that's okay too, right? So I, I don't think everybody needs to be super jazzed about education, but finding where you feel your role and feel your need and feel that you are fulfilled is critical in whatever you're doing in medicine. I think that's, that's really helpful to hear. And as a resident myself, I think I sometimes wonder what some of the barriers for Co- my co-residents or people like me or medical students, like what those barriers are to becoming a teacher or finding those teaching opportunities. Sometimes wonder, is it the lack of time? Is it fear that I'm not quite an expert in a given field or topic? Um, what, what do you find are the most prevalent barriers I mean, I think there's the obvious ones that you mentioned, which is time, resources, that sort of thing. I think everybody can point to those ones. But I honestly, I think the biggest barrier that stands in people's way is confidence. Um, I think every single person who's ever done anything educational has got out there and said, 
am I the right person to be teaching this? Um, or you'll be up there giving a conference or giving a lecture and you look at the front row and you'll see 10 people up there who you think would teach this better than how you're teaching it. Um, and I think that's the biggest barrier, especially for those learners who are still in that stage of professional identity and still in that stage of forming their self-confidence of just breaking through that and saying, just teach. Um, it's okay not to know everything. It's okay not to have all the answers. It's okay not to give the perfect lecture. It's okay not to give the perfect shock talk. Anything you're going to provide is going to be additional value than nothing. And so I think breaking through and understanding that mental barrier that we impose upon ourselves of being too shy to do it, too shy to put ourselves out there, lacking that confidence, feeling that judgment that might be coming across in those learners that's totally imagined in your head and breaking through that and just reaching out. That's the biggest barrier. I think once you break through that enough times and you start feeling comfortable with, I am a teacher, then I think it all starts falling into place. Those other barriers, time, energy, money, those are things you can wrestle with. That mental imposed barrier, that's the one that the only person who can break through that one is you. I do want to say just to take a quick um, shout out and pause. I do love that I'm on a podcast with energetic pediatricians because I feel like re-energized. I mean, I love my job and I love educating, but I feel like if it was possible, I'm usually operating at an 11 out of 10 level, but I feel like I'm now going up to a 15 out of 10 just by being on this with y'all. So I um, just want to highlight that it is contagious what you're saying. And and Travis, I also love, you know, I feel like you're, the way you talked about that barrier kind of harkens back to your um comment earlier about like being enough and like you are enough to start teaching like yeah. just start somewhere and um i really hope that folks listening can kind of hear that and and really take that kernel of motivation and run with it and i wonder in you know tim's case i wonder if you could advise you know if, if tim is ready to take on the the challenge and the excitement of starting a program like this, do you kind of have any resources to suggest for Tim or, you know, maybe sharing pieces of advice for what it was like to start the um, program, like, uh, as you did earlier. And then you kind of mentioned this like interprofessional, you know, health professions, education milieu, that's really rich to do uh, this type of um, development work as well. And maybe kind of how would you tie in that aspect uh, to help Tim start this program? Yeah. I, you know, I think, Finding your finding your mentors and finding your sponsors are key of any type of these things. And those are slightly different things. We talk about mentors, people who are going to guide you on the path. The sponsors are the people who put you in positions to succeed, right? Saying, oh, I know somebody who's going to be perfect for this, Tim. Let's put Tim. That, that's your sponsor. So I think finding those people. So like I said, at Baylor, we were very lucky that the first people we approached said, yes, and, and let's help you do this. And let me give you, and they let us run. But they, like I said, they put those guardrails on and said, okay, but what about this? And how would you do this? And they asked very open-ended but yet leading questions that allowed us to get to the right place. So I think finding those people are going to be really important. Now, Tim is in a position where it sounds like he's at a rural, smaller program. And so finding those, those things might be a little bit tougher. There are lots of resources out there. Um, honestly, if you just Googled residents as teachers, um, you'll see a lot of different places that have instituted programs that have come up. Um, there's even some national websites that have some things. The AMC has some stuff out there. So looking at um, where you want to go on that and, and what you want to implement is going to be important. I think... The biggest advice I would give to somebody like Tim is to find people who have done this and ask and talk to them. So, you know, if you look and you, you know, you guys did your research and found that I did this, right? If I had a Tim at rural hospital reach out to me and say, hey, you don't know me, but I'm interested in doing this. Can I chat? I would 100% make a time for that meeting and say, yes, let's chat. Let's talk about this. Um, and so I, I think, you know, in education, Educators want to educate. They want to teach. They want to talk to you about this. So find those people. And I would not be shy about cold calling or cold emailing people and saying, I'd love to learn more about this. How do I do this? What are the things I need to know? Because I, I think no matter how much guidance you look at, at toolboxes or you look at pre-designed curriculum and programs, finding that generalized ability, finding what's going to fit for you and everything is going to be tough. But more importantly, getting that wisdom of what worked and what were the pitfalls so that I can avoid those as I go through this is crucial. And so I'd reach out to other people. That's the biggest advice I have for you. And I know in this day and age, like that feels awkward. It feels a little funny just to reach out to folks, but I guarantee you, you will find like-minded individuals. The other way, if you're a little bit more gun shy about doing a cold calling is go to conferences. Um, you know, go to the AAMC conference, go to, uh, one of the GEA conferences, go to the, uh, 
pediatric educate or sorry the uh, program educators conferences right so the department the residency program leadership conferences go to those and ask questions meet people and say here's what i'm interested in and you will find you know 99 out of 100 of them will say yes i'd love to tell you more um and, and so that's that's the biggest advice break that one down um to answer the second part of the question about interprofessionalism it's key uh, i i i think that whatever we decide to do in today's day and age of working through in different teams, it needs to be inclusive of those folks. And so thinking about how do I include that into whatever I'm building is going to be uh, a huge, huge boon to on both ends of the spectrum, right? So, so the learners, if you're designing a program and you've included social work, nursing, nurse practitioners into those things, number one, institutional buy-in is going to go way up because it's going to benefit a huge swath of the entire institution. So getting more resources, getting more expertise, getting more mentors involved will be a much easier sell. And then the second benefit of that is that we all learn differently. We all have a little bit different educational background. We all bring different things to the table. And so that collaborative learning that comes from different levels and different lenses will open up so many doors. I think one of the things that will make you instantly, instantly a better teacher is realizing that your learners don't learn the same way you do. And, you know, I say it, Cleo's heard me say this, like, I say it like that teach, re- learners don't fail to learn. Teachers fail to teach. So if I'm putting something out there and my learner isn't understanding that, that's not on my learner. That's on me. I haven't reached them and I need to figure out a different way to teach. And having that interprofessional part of this educational program will build that and bake that in from the ground up so that you're constantly focusing and reassessing on what are the most effective teaching methods? Do I need to vary my strategies? Do I need to vary my levels of how I teach and what I talk about into making this a successful program? We've, so you sort of talked about it in, in sort of broad senses, and I know every situation, every program, every hospital residency is going to be different. Yeah. Um, I guess from do you have so if I'm come if Tim's coming to you, he's he's reaching out to you yeah. and he's saying, hey, what are some of the examples of things that went well and what didn't went well in in when in your implementations? Um, can you do you have examples uh, for for him? Yeah, I you know I, th- I think the first advice I would have for Tim is I'd ask him what he's trying to accomplish, um, and I the more concrete you can be with that the better. And I think that one of the things that when people take on educational ventures, they get into eh, not necessarily trouble, but they find some difficulty in the weeds is not having a clear outcome, not understanding where they want to end up. They know what they want to do, and so they start doing it. And then you have no idea if you're successful or not, or if you've gone off course and you didn't quite end up where you wanted to end up, you don't know why. And so I think understanding exactly where you want to end up. So in Tim's case, I would ask him very clearly what he's trying to accomplish. Is he trying to get personal mentoring shift for him? Is he trying to build something that's for selected for the residents? Is he trying to build something that would be baked into all the residents? These are all very different targets to hit. And so understanding a little bit about what's the target? What's the purpose of this? Because that's going to look different at every program, every institution. It's going to look different for every individual. If Tim's goal is to set up something like an educational program for selected people, so people who have self-differentiated that I'm going to do in education as my profession. And so of our class, you know, a handful of us are always going to do this type of thing. Um, I, I think the the things that I would stress are one, that well-rounded nature of it, that most people are going to naturally gravitate towards wanting to get better teachers. Um, and so that's that's where they're going to focus their time and energy. And yes, that's the invigorating part. That's that's the exciting part. We love the doing. And so I think that having to pull back on the reins just a little bit and being very intentional with that theory, being very intentional with baking in some of those other parts where you talk about administrative duties, talking about understanding uh, what it means to be an educator in medicine as a profession um, is necessary. But I also think that if you go too heavy handed with that, you lose interest. People, it becomes too dry, too boring. It's not aligned with what they want to come out. And so I, having that balance and understanding how that works and how, how that feels and what that fits into is necessary. I think the other thing that I would caution Tim on is that no matter what you do, no matter how much thought and energy you put into this, it ain't going to be right the first time and that's okay. You're going to find flaws. You're going to find problems. You're going to find things to fix. And again, that's the beauty of curriculum design in itself. If you're not adapting and changing you're probably forgetting something. And so I think just knowing that there's going to be those necessary changes that are going to have to be made is okay. And don't look at that as a failure. Don't look at that as a setback. Look at that as the opportunity to make what you've already started with and make it even better. Um, I I think those are kind of the the biggest take-home message I would say to somebody who's starting that program. Um, And then I think 
understanding what that curriculum is going to look like, what's the time, energy, cost, and the trade-off. Residents are busy. They're very busy. And so understand that time, energy, trade-off in terms of developing this to, do you have to devote enough time to the background learning, to didactics, to putting this into practice and actually getting a chance to do this. Um, and, and so finding that balance of, so it feels fun and energizing and not onerous and something else you're having to check off that box to do. And Travis, if Tim is looking for a blueprint besides Baylor's Academy of Resident Educators, and maybe his goal is actually to do what you mentioned earlier around the interprofessional kind of um, learning environment and making sure that we are learning from people who are in other roles and who have been uh, teachers as well and doing it well. Do you have any programs or kind of pe people that come to mind um, that would serve as a blueprint for Tim, potentially other people who are doing uh, similar work? Yeah, I mean, so I think there's uh, AIM has a has a toolbox out there for residents as teachers, which is a really nice one. It's got a curriculum resources thing that you can go to. That, that sorry, AIM A I A A I M um, is is one of the ones that you can go to. Um, but then, like I said, you know, honestly, uh, if you Google residents as teachers and you look at what comes up. Um, you look at the programs that are up there. It's like a who's who of medical education um, across this country. And I think I would reach out to any one of those. North Carolina has an excellent program. Um, Vanderbilt, I'm going to plug my own institution, has an excellent program. Uh. Stanford has an excellent program that's out there. Um, Seattle does a fantastic job. And so I, I think, you know, looking at sort of the who's who of educational names and looking at those things, um, you'll, you'll see them come up. And, and I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be hesitant to reach out to any of those people, nor would I think it's wrong just to flat out steal from them. The other thing, and I mean that in the kindest way, right? Like mm. we give credit where credit's due. You give, you say, hey, we borrowed this from so-and-so. Um, but again, as an educator at heart, I, you know, nothing would please me more than if I found out Tim was using Travis Crook's lecture on something or whatever, I'd be like, that's amazing. Um, mm. the, other, the other big resource that I would highly encourage that if you're not knee deep in the education world, you may not be aware of is MedEd Portal. Um, MedEd Portal started, uh, oh gosh, it's been like 15 years now. Um, it started way back as like this repository where you could put in, here's something that's good that I did. And it's actually become, uh, one of the harder things to get something submitted to now because you have to prove efficacy, you have to prove that it works and have to prove that it's well received. Um, but it's got a whole myriad of teaching tools, topics, and there's actually several uh, toolboxes on how to put in education uh, academies in MedEd Portal. So if you look through there, there's there's several ones. There's like a 10, uh, a 10 module one that's already in there that's pre-built. There's several other ones. And say you find one topic on there that's like the teaching physical exam skills. Man, search that up and you will find literally 50 different ways to do it and find the one that you like blend them together, steal from them and, and collaborate and make, make, that's where I would start. MedEd Portal is a fantastic resource to try and get started on how to teach something. Great. I'll be sure to include those links in the show notes as well. All right. So we have more from Tim. He's now a third year resident on the wards and he wants to put his teaching skills into practice. He sits down with the intern and the third-year medical student on his team on the first day of the rotation. He checks in with them to discuss their goals. The medical student tells him that she wants to work on her physical exam skills. And the intern on the team sets the goal of working on his teaching skills. Tim asks to further clarify with this very big goal um, and to clarify which teaching skills he would like to focus on. And the intern says that they would like to work on teaching physical exam skills. So how can you, how can Tim rather support his intern to feel confident in teaching? Like we discussed, this lack of confidence can serve as a barrier to um, starting to teach. Yeah. I mean, first, can we just give a shout out to Tim? Uh, yeah, here's, yeah. here's Tim, the upper <laughs> level, sitting down with both levels of learners and asking what their goals are. First of all, amazing, right? Like that's, uh, what more could you ask for from an upper level? And then secondly, once he got those goals, he further clarified and said, tell me a little bit more. Um, Tim's doing a fantastic job. Tim truly has the heart of an educator. He's well on his way. Um, so first of all, big shout out to Tim. Secondly, uh, to answer that question, right? So we talked about that confidence. Um, I, I think that Tim putting that intern into a position to is going to be critical, right? So him saying, oh, I love this. And guess what? The third year student is interested in learning this. I think this would be great. Let's have you guys teach together and let's let's figure this out. I think that now the stage is set, right? And 
Tim is going to tell the intern, you can do this and is putting them in a position, kind of forcing them into that play, position and saying, hey, I got you. You go do this. Um, one that'll help break down that activation energy of them stepping up to the plate, which is great. Um, I, I think the next step is to ask the intern what they're going to teach, right? So this is building in that that sense of accountability. Just what we talked about from some of these other things, again, over and over again, again, you, you get an education, you, it's going to get beaten to your head. Where do you want to end up? What's the end? What's the goal? Work backwards. So talking with that intern and saying, if you were going to teach physical exam skills, what would you teach? What do you want your learner to walk away with? Once we understand that, we can build backwards on how we're going to teach that, what's going to be the most effective way to get through that message. And so I think building that up and setting that on that clear path and providing those guardrails for that intern will very clearly help them hone in on how they're going to teach, what they're going to teach, how to focus that on down, as opposed to this nebulous concept of teach physical exam skills. Whew. Right, I mean, we have whole year-long courses in medical school for that. Um, that's a lot for an intern to take on. But if we narrow this down to, you know, I'm really interested in cardiology. I like murmurs. I think I can teach the physical exam about heart. Be like, awesome. You've got a third-year medical student who's here with you. If they were going to leave this rotation with you, what's the one thing you want them to walk away from when talking about physical exam with cardiology or with murmurs? Be like, well, I want them to be able to distinguish normal from abnormal. Like, Great. How are you going to do that? And walk them backwards through that process so that by the time the intern sits down with that student, they already have that game plan in their head. Um, And I I think that you let them kind of run with that and explore with that. And then after the fact, you debrief, right? So this is the other part of this is you're going to provide that feedback on the back end of them. So having that debriefing moment of saying, you taught, how did it go? What worked well and what didn't work well? And part of that feedback is also then pointing out intentionality of modeling. I think that as educators, we don't do this enough. Um, the number one thing, if you want to win teaching awards, it's a big, big secret here. You want to win teaching awards. The number one thing to do is say, I'm teaching. So framing that, that intentionality, that modeling is important. So what Tim's going to do on the back end is when he's debriefing is then explain to him what went well and what didn't go well and why. So Tim's going to sit down and say, hey, remember when we started out and I put those guidelines on you or those guardrails and I started asking those probing questions? This is why I did that, right? So that's going to build up the intentionality of one, both Tim is now intentionally learning how to teach that. But number two, that intern is learning that that's what defines you as an educator, right? The difference between being a teacher and an educator is intentionality. Teachers get up there and teach and they have natural talent. Educators are intentional with the messages they're trying to get across. Nice. Now so, I know the secret sauce. That's right. I, I know. Say, right. I you just need a shirt that says I'm teaching. I'm teaching. <laughs> it's like the it's like the correlate to the feedback conversation Absolutely. where <laughs> residents are like, I got no feedback this what? entire and I've been the person who has said that. So I, you know, I feel it. But then you're like, okay, I'm going to name that we are having a feedback conversation right. with this student, resident, fellow, whoever it is. Um, that's been very uh, helpful to these the folks I work with. Yeah, no, absolutely. Doing feedback, you have to use the F word, right? Feedback. You gotta say it. You gotta say it. If you don't say yeah, it, it, then people may not realize it and it may slide right off. It refocuses. Same thing with teaching. And part of that, when we talk about building, you know, at the heart of teaching as well, when we talk about clinical environment, that, that that educational safety, feeling that safe learning environment. When you say teaching, you're now changing that onus, right? Especially, especially if we're talking about patient care. So if I'm teaching about patient care and I don't frame it as teaching and I'm asking questions. And my intern, my residents, or my medical student starts thinking about this is actually tied to that patient's care, that ups the stakes. And they may be more hesitant to participate. They may be more hesitant to put out the wrong answers. When we say we're teaching and we're learning and we put that frame on it, it creates a little bit of a safety net for them to explore and to push. And that's what we're looking for. Uh, so I love the labels there too. Another label I really like saying as I've, as I've grown in my career is also saying mentoring. So saying, I'm mentoring you and we're going to have a mentoring session. And so another thing that I've realized as I've grown is also peer mentorship. So, you know, my colleagues who are with me, we're in the same sort of region of our careers. And so when we're sort of looking at Tim here, you know, he's almost, he's sort of a a, a teaching peer as well because he's a resident and he's teaching his intern. Do you feel there are benefits to these types of uh, more peer teaching type situations? Is it is it better because um, you have a, a senior resident who is actually very close in terms of, of learning and teaching and so might be able to 
teaching skills better than maybe an attending might be able to do? I absolutely love that question because I, I think it's it's unequivocally yes. And I think it's a yes and bi-directionally, right? So I think there's benefits to both parties on this when we have that sort of peer teaching relationship. When you are teaching a peer or a near peer, that relevancy and that applicability is just going to be heightened, right? You know what that other person is needs out of this, right? You were just there. And Tim has just been an intern before. He knows what it means, like what the self-confidence issues are, how you're going to get across those medical students. The generational gaps are much smaller. We're talking about in terms of how do we reach those learners. And so absolutely there's going to be that. And then the other way around is also critical, right? There's a difference when Tim gets to teach a peer as opposed to teaching somebody who is, um, you know, more junior to him or more senior to him. And that comfortability and being able to share and being able to be vulnerable and having that honesty comes across, um, I, I think it just hits differently. And so I think there's a tremendous amount of uh, value in those experiences for both the teacher and learner in those near peer teaching experiences. Travis, you know, we're all evidence-based people. Absolutely. And I wonder um, within this realm of kind of learners as teachers, do we have any data or any evidence that kind of your, you know, the Baylor Academy or aca similar academies have um produced maybe kind of uh, more prepared faculty educators in the future or kind of that that um, type of pre preparation and training really early on helps in your future career? So, man, the $64,000 question, what's mm -hmm. the evidence? Um, I love that it's 64000 and not the 250000 question. Right. <laughs> so I picked it, honed in on that number. Thank, thank you for pointing out how old I am. I really appreciate that. That's that No, I love good. it. I was. Um, you know, I feel like that's from Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, which I love that show. Uh, yeah. So, no, I, I, I think, um, yeah, it's... It, the, the question, unfortunately, is still a little bit undecided. Um, we look at are other fields? And the answer is unequivocally yes, right? There's, and so we see that the sooner you get involved in research, it prepares you on that pathway to be successful. We see the folks who start doing those research in undergraduate medical education are more likely to get grants, right? We, we, we have clear evidence that supports that because grants are tangible. They're easy to prove. You have a backlog of tracing of those type of things. Education is a bit harder, right? So the, the question is, what makes a successful educator? Is it holding down a position, a named title? Is it winning awards? It depends. And trying to suss that one out is a lot, lot harder. And unfortunately, our study, especially in medical education, is really still in its infancy in terms of what's our effectiveness to look like and what proves to be efficacious. I would argue that even if the evidence isn't quite there yet, two things. Number one, if it works for everything else in our professional, why wouldn't it work for this? Um, I think anecdotally, you see it. I think those folks who are invested in it and want to have that early on and are encouraged and built up, feel more confident, feel more prepared, are ready to take on those challenges and are going to be more successful. I think you see it. Um, for those of us who have gone through and continue to do these type of things and we build them up, I think you see it and, and there's evidence for it. But I think this is also be a thing that I would put out a huge call to all the folks listening to this, that this is an area that of, for study and for looking for richness, right? And so thinking about how do we define those outcomes, which is going to be the challenging one. Um, you know, things that have been kicked around, like I said, teaching awards, named physicians, chief residencies. These are things that you can look for. The return rate, unfortunately, when you try to keep up contact with those things is really small. At each step of the way, folks become more distant from whoever's trying to study them. If you were in UME and you go to GME, response rates back from our, our uh, former students who are in GME, it's just not great. When you're in GME and you go on to be faculty, unless you stay at the institution, it's hard to track. And so it becomes this problem of, unless we as educators all kind of band together and decide to make this a priority in terms of proving the efficacy of this, the data is going to be always just a little bit hard to come by. So I would say the data is soft, but it makes sense and it works with everything else. And I think that anecdotally it's there. I think we just have to take the next step and prove it. All right. Well, I have another question for you, Travis. And for our listeners without a robust knowledge of um, adult learning theory, bonus visual for our video streamers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what makes an adult learner unique uh, and how can we tailor our teaching experiences to the adult learner? Yeah. So, you know, you can do a lot of reading on this. There's a ton of books that are out there. And so if you're really interested and you want to nerd out on it, go for it. I mean, you literally cannot read all the stuff on this now. Um, but I, I think the short of it is a couple of things of recognizing that adult learners are going to be self-motivated. 
um, they're going to come to you with their own internal motivations. Now, part of that means you have to understand what that motivation is. Tim asked, what is your objective, right? They're there to learn and they recognize that. But what they want to learn may not be what you want to teach them. And so you have to make sure that you understand and come across with that. And so understanding what their motivation is going to be, but acknowledging they're already motivated. They're already there. I think the other big, big key tenant that I would say when you're talking about with adult learners is that they're going to draw on experience. They've lived a lifetime already before you've got a touch of them. And so they're going to draw upon things they've already built up, they've already experienced, they've already done good and bad. Sometimes they already may be more advanced and have done things or seen things. They may have developed some bad habits that we got to unlearn. Um, so it's good and bad, but you have to understand that they're coming with a wealth of experience. This is not a novel thing for them. I think if you incorporate those two things, they're Depending on which you read, there's five, seven, eight, ten tenets of adult learners. Uh, but I think those are the two key ones. If you come away with understanding that they're already motivated, but you have to understand what their motivations are and you have to match it, and that they're going to draw on experiences, both good and bad, and you understand that factor, you do those two things, and I think you're on the right pathway for an adult learner. So many pearls, Travis, <laughs> just dropping them. <laughs> I'm trying to like after you after you you say everything. I'm just trying to like process everything. I was like, that that was amazing, and I was like, how am I going to integrate all this stuff? It's, <laughs> it's it's so good. It's so good. Travis, you mentioned at the very beginning, kind of that Tim is a uh, very robust in his third year, and he's come up with you know talking about negotiating goals and objectives for his learners. And in his case, the intern and the student are aligned in what they want to learn. And I wonder if that particular advantage um, kind of offers us a nice approach for how Tim can kind of uh, start the process of um, maybe even coaching his uh, learners to be learners as teachers now that he's experienced it. And if there's any particular tools that you might offer Tim, if let's say you were his mentor at his institution. Yeah. So I, you know, I think uh, in guiding Tim in this process, you know, we talked about first setting down a us for success, asking him to go through and, and, and what he would want to get out of this. I think that it might be an appropriate time to model that back as well and say, so you're interested in teaching cardiology. Do you know if your student's interested in learning cardiology? Right? And just kind of let that dangle a little bit. Um, and and helping to guide them and understand that and saying what's going to be there. And then I think the next thing, you know, let's say the student says, Yeah, I'd love to learn cardiology or whatever. The next thing is to understand what do you know? Right? So what do you bring to the table? What are you good at? What are you struggling with? If I say I'm interested in teaching cardiology and you say you're interested in learning. Tell me why. What do you want to get out of this? Right. And so having Tim, like Tim just did this, the intern, have that intern then parrot that back to the to the student and, and keep working that down the line um, in that intentional manner, I think will set them up for success because they're already aligned, which is wonderful. Um, I think one of the other things is it, we've talked about in this case, we're going to be teaching a skill. Let's say we're teaching cardiology, we're listening to murmurs. That's the example we've been going with. So I think understanding how we teach a skill. And so, you know, great. It's great that we're going to teach it. And now we know what we want to accomplish. We now need to figure out how are you going to teach that? And there's a lot of resources. Again, MedEd Portal is a wonderful resource for this. You can look at this. But I, I think that understanding if we're doing a skill, there's different ways of teaching skills as opposed to teaching knowledge. Again, we talked about briefly, we touched on uh, Bloom's taxonomy, which is knowledge-based. Simpson's is in our taxonomy, which is based on skills learning. Um, and so understanding what that looks like and how we're going to teach those things. There's plenty of resources out there. You put in Simpson's taxonomy, um, you'll see things much out there. And there's oftentimes wheels of not only action verse, but then how to teach those things. Um, those are the things that you're going to look through and kind of look through those ways to do it. Um, teaching skills, very, very different than teaching knowledge. Um, I, they, they come from different, different train. And so I would have the intern walk me through what they intended to do and be like, if you're going to teach us, how would you do it? And if they nailed it on the first try, then we can build upon that. We can refine it, that sort of thing. I think in general, the interns can be like, well, I'm going to listen to it and then tell the student to listen to it. And then I'll ask what they heard. Like, okay. And how do you think that's going to go and get them to process through and get to that end step. Be like, is there a better way to do this? If my goal, we talked about it, my goal is to get them to distinguish normal from abnormal. How am I going to get there? 
Let's talk through those ways. What are the ways that we can teach? How can we get creative about this? How can we integrate this into what we're doing? Um, and there's all kinds of really interesting ways of doing that. And I don't know how deep you want me to go into this, um, but we, we can we can delve deeply into how to teach physical exam skills, for instance, if we want to. Um, particularly with cardiology, um, teaching uh, bird calls is a fantastic way to learn how to teach cardiology. And I'll let you uh, figure that one out on your own. Um, but, uh, you know, and so I, I think that as we're doing this, and this is flavored a little bit by the way I like to teach is leading them there, right? I think the more that they connect, my learners connect the dots for themselves, the better off they're going to be. And they start seeing those lightning bolt moments. And so I think if I've done my job, if Tim's done his job to this intern, this intern will have felt like they were the ones who created this lesson plan when in reality, Tim gave them an outline and let them fill in the blanks. So... Right now I'm on inpatient service and I have my own residents and interns and med students. And I, I know that my intern right now, I've, I've walked in and he's there teaching the med students and he's doing a great job. And as I'm thinking about Tim here, like if I'm his attending and I sort of know what he's trying to do, what's, what's the best way that I can, I can support him? How can I help him in, in this, in this sort of, hierarchy of sort of learner teacher learner teacher sandwich sort of situation yeah i mean the first thing i would ask back to you uh chris is that did you uh tell your resident that they're doing an awesome job teaching because you just told me do they know yes most definitely perfect right that's step one right and because i think that feeds back into that confidence issue right that we all have we everybody everybody has a little bit of imposter syndrome some of us have a whole lot more than others um and i'd love to tell you that it goes away it certainly doesn't um but providing that feedback from somebody you trust, you know, to go to come in and say like, "Hey, I know you're teaching, and you were good, right?" Like taking that simple moment of telling them that, it means the world to it, right? So that positive reinforcement. So much of what we talk about as learners or in medicine is negative reinforcement. We learn from our mistakes, which is great. Mistakes are a fantastic way to learn, right? The only mistake you truly make is the one you don't learn from. Um, but so rarely do we receive that positive reinforcement, particularly when it's good. Tell them why it was good too. I saw you teaching it was good and here's why, right? This is what I saw you do. Keep doing that. Or I saw you do this and it, you know what would take the next step would be to do it this way, right? And that will make it even better. So I think first of all, that's the first thing I would do is I, would, I provide that positive reinforcement when I see Tim doing these things. The second thing I would do is I would sit down with Tim and just like I, I'm asking Tim to debrief with the intern, I would debrief with Tim. And so I would sit down with Tim and be like, Tim, I saw you coaching the intern up. How did it go with him? Right. And, and understand like what's Tim's thought process on this and, and understand. And then I'd ask Tim, Tim, did you sit down and debrief with the intern? Just like we're doing right now. So similar things, right. Modeling all the way up, it's turtles all the way down. Same idea is that we're going to keep on doing those same things that are going to build them up and build that skill set, refining what he's doing well pointing out how he can improve and do better, but most of all, encouraging him to keep on keeping on. I'm sorry, Travis, did you say it's turtles all the way down? Yeah. And what does that mean? Oh, I snuck that in on you. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, <laughs> without going too deep into I it. I mean, I use a lot of animal <laughs> analogies in my world and people are like, Ira, what do you mean be a goldfish? You know, Ted Lassoism, but like turtles all the way down. That's a new one for me. Goldfish actually have surprisingly long memories, but I know um, it's so not true. I know, I know, but, but turtles all the way it. down. So, uh, without getting too deeply into either religious or ethical conversations, um, there are some branches of philosophy, but that believe that the world is balanced on the back of a turtle. And the question then is, well, what's that turtle resting on? It's another turtle. What's that turtle's resting on? It's turtles all the way down is the answer. I love it. Got it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'm so good at I, I was the only one who didn't somewhere. understand that. So it's like an explanation <laughs> around how the world exists. That's correct. So I'm yeah, still yeah, stuck. Yeah, yeah. So, For some of us are concrete learners. I'm just like imagining turtles and then connecting it to teaching and then trying to like work with it. Sorry. So you. So welcome to my brain. I apologize. Um, I My brain... Cleo has had to have the unfortunate uh, misguidings of, of learning with me and being on my service. Um, I liken my teaching style and my leadership style to a cat chasing a laser pointer. Um, my brain is nonstop bouncing off the walls. And so <sighs> things just slip out sometimes. And sometimes huh? you get turtles all the way down. You know, I was going to imagine. 
I was just saying, I'm trying to imagine an, a, an amazing infographic, Cleo, that you should make for this episode that somehow has turtles stacked on top of Lorders each other. Lorders all the way down. With, yes. Oh. <laughs> Lorders all the way down. Absolutely. I, I think it. we should keep it at turtles. I think we should. I think the turtle. I think learners stacked on each other. There's just problems with that. But turtles. Turtles. I feel like turtles are that just doing their thing. hilarious. I was going to say that this episode reminds me a lot about... Re- of being on service with you. I'm so, <laughs> I'm so sorry, Cleo. Uh, it's, just, it's just, you know, this is, this is what you get. And what, what you see. Like I said, I am surprised that I was asked back. Here we are. No. Well, no, I, was also, I was also going to say that I was, it reminded me so much of being in service with you that I wanted to wrap up in the way that you typically wrap up rounds, making us tell you what we learned on rounds today. But um, instead, I'll have you tell us what some of the take home points that you want us to to remember from this episode. I love that. I'm, you know, thanks for that plug. I'm going to drop that anyway. If you're an educator and you're leading a service, um, I wrap up every single one of my days on rounds by before we run the list, you must tell me one thing you learned today on rounds. We are here to learn. Yes, patient care is there, but the patient care will always be there. But you are there to learn. And therefore, the learning takes priority before we run the list. And that is intentional. You must tell me when you learn. And it's surprising. You do it on Monday, and the learners will struggle to recall those things. Even though you may have taught something about every single patient, they will struggle. And by Friday, they'll have six or seven things they've, they've remembered that they learned. And that recall is what allows that to sink in. All right? So don't let those learning moments escape in that fog of the, of the work getting done. Um, things that you should take away from this. Sorry, that was just my own personal plug right there. Um, Things that you should take away from the session is, um, yeah, if I haven't said it enough, I'm going to say it again. Start with the end of mind. I'm sure that every single one of these educational ones has some kind of message that you know where your outcome is coming from. And I, I think that's critical no matter what we're talking about. Where we're talking about building a program of residents as educators, turning out how am I going to mentor my learner? Where do I want them to end up? Start with understanding where you want to go and build backwards from there. Um I think that the other thing that I would really, really encourage to take away from all of this is that if you want to teach, do it. Don't wait for somebody to ask. Don't wait for that opportunity of like, well, there's nobody else raising their hand. Don't wait for somebody to thrust you into that spotlight of being like, okay, well, now I've got to do it. Break down the barrier and do it, man. You providing teaching is better than nothing, right? Just start there. You've provided some value. That's great. Um, so I, I think those are the two biggest takeaways. We start talking about more specifically learners as teachers. Be intentional with them. Be intentional with your modeling. Tell them why you're doing what you're doing. Don't just let it be this mysticism. I've had some wonderful mentors, some wonderful teachers over the years that six years later, I was like, oh, right? And I wish mm. they had told me in the moment, right? And maybe I still would have had that moment of realization later on down the road, but allow them to capitalize on that. So be intentional, be intentional with your modeling and explain why. Awesome. Awesome. Travis, is there anything you want to plug in case um, something has popped up for you that you're like, I want learner or listeners to, and learners, listeners to check something out, maybe something you're working on or something you've produced? Something I'm working on, something I produce. Oh, turtle like, painting. Turtle paintings know. all the way down. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to Cleo's artwork rendition of Turtle Learners All the Way Down. Um, that's going to be spectacular. You got to check that one out. Cleo, now you're on the spot. You have to do it. Um, I think that if you are really interested in what this could look like at the UME level, because we talked a little bit about GME where this is becoming more acceptable. There's HGMA competencies around teaching. It's an expectation. Um, if you're interested in this in UME level, uh, there might be a paper that is coming out very soon from Vanderbilt University that explains an implementation guide of how one might go about instituting students as teachers in the medical world. Amazing. Thanks, Travis. That was great. Thank you, Thank you so much. That's awesome. Wow. What an amazing episode. I feel not only energized, but also ready to take on uh, kind of the inspirational and amazing work of uh, having our learners be teachers. And I think one of the things I'm going to take home from this episode, Cleo and Chris, is that I love the differentiation of educators as intentional and um, in their teaching and kind of that that's the thing that differentiates teachers from educators and being able to say, you know, I am I am doing this because of X, Y, Z and explaining why you're teaching and explaining kind of and naming, I should say, the teaching moment. And I'm going to start to really integrate that into my um, role modeling of teaching as well. But Cleo, what about you? What are your take home points from today? 
I agree. Definitely learning about being more intentional about when you're teaching and who you're teaching. But also, I think one of the biggest take home pearls from the episode for me was learning about what motivates who you're teaching, what knowledge they currently have, and what is making them excited to learn in that moment. My favorite takeaway, or at least the one I, I'm, I'm remember right now as an attending, is really when you're seeing your learner be a teacher. You really just got to give them that positive feedback. Tell them you're doing a great job or give them good feedback if there are ways to make it better. But you know, positively, positivity creates positivity and excitement. And so if we're all enjoying teaching together and you're able to get that excitement onto your learners who also want to be teachers, that's like the best place to be. I love that, Chris. And just to highlight for our listeners who um, may have heard, heard Travis talking about backward design, talking about physical exam, talking about the science of learning, kind of that recall, um, it, please check out our episodes on all those topics um, in Curbsiders Teach Season 1, 2, and 3. Um, we have uh, wonderful folks um, uh, Andre Monsoor, Kendra Van Kirk, Charlotte Jakin, and others teaching about those topics. So please uh, check that out. So this has been another episode of our Curbsiders mini series, The Curbsiders Teach, a special crossover with The Curbsiders. Uh, get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com slash teach. And a special thanks to Dr. Matt Watto and Dr. Paul Williams for their support in this project and to Dr. Stuart Brigham for composing the theme music. And of course, to the team at Podpaste for the editing of our audio. And a special shout out to our social media team Andrew Gillat on Instagram and John Ong on Twitter. Until next time, I've been Dr. Ira Krzyzanowskaya. We're committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review our show on Apple Podcasts or contact us at thecurbsidersteach at gmail.com. I've been Cleo Rochat. A reminder that this and most episodes are available for free CME credit for all healthcare professionals at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. All you have to do is create an account. Thank you for joining us today and letting us bring you a little nugget of medical edutainment. I've been Chris the Chimanchu. See y'all. Bye. Yay. Bye.